Hi. Uh, so my name is Matt Banks, and um, I'm in the Department of Anesthesiology. And I study the um, auditory part of the neocortex. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you, to you today uh, just about a couple of things. Um, so I, I teach a course on, uh, on this material that I'm going to cover today, and it takes an entire semester. And I'm going to try to squeeze that into 20 minutes. <laughs> So I'm going to talk really fast, and I have 500 slides. No, I'm so I'm just going to make two points. So uh, the two points that I'm going to make, I'm going to talk about musical tension, and I'm going to talk about how that relates to the neural basis of expectation. And that's going to um, sort of lead nicely into uh, Jenny's talk, the last uh, science part of the talk. And I'm going to talk about what's called auditory scene analysis and auditory illusions. And, and what that refers to is uh, how we uh, identify particular musical instruments, for example, that are playing in an orchestra, and, uh, and the cases in which we can identify and separate those out, and the cases in which we can't. OK. So to get started, I want to talk about the, uh, the neocortex. Um, and uh, the neocortex is, um, is composed of a sheet of cells. And the sheet of cells is not much bigger than, than these two pieces of paper. And um, the thickness of the sheet is about two millimeters in a human. Uh, and interestingly, uh, in a mouse, which are the animals that I study, the thickness of the sheet is one millimeter. So uh, in a human, um, which is many, many, many times bigger than a mouse, there are 100 billion neurons packed into this two millimeter sheet that's about this big. That's uh, the same number as the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and, um, and the neocortex, so cortex means bark, so it's this sort of wrinkled, um, this wrinkled uh, surface structure of the brain, and why is it wrinkled? Well, so we have to fit this sheet into this head, okay? And how do you do that? Well, you pull it up, okay? And that's why the neocortex is wrinkled. And in many animals, such as mice, the neocortex is smooth because you can fit the sheet, which in a mouse is smaller than a stamp, uh, inside of their little tiny uh, rodent heads. Uh, okay, so the neocortex is, um, uh, is composed of specialized regions, which are um, uh, which uh, do a lot of the uh, processing that we associate with, uh, with being uh, human and being conscious. Um, so, for example, uh, the visual, uh, visual information activates cells in the, uh, in the rear or the occipital part of, of the brain. Uh, auditory information activates cells in the temporal lobe, which is this area on the side, over here and over here. Uh, and uh, it's important uh, to realize that, that uh, the neocortex, our neocortex, is essentially um, it's essentially what, what we are as, as conscious people. It, it contains uh, pretty much all of our memories, uh, and it uh, does um, the lion's share of our decision-making processes and sensory, um, high-level sensory processing and things like that. Uh, and it's, uh, the other thing about the neocortex is, is that it's um, exclusive to mammals. So, uh, so for example, reptiles and, uh, and birds don't have a neocortex. And so it's a relatively late addition in the, uh, in the evolution of, uh, of animal species. OK. So the auditory pathway, as uh, Ruth nicely introduced, um, sort of begins in the, uh, in the sensory epithelium and the cochlea. And, um, and the classic view of the auditory pathway is that it's this ascending pathway, that information comes in from the outside world, and it goes through these different levels in the, in the uh, brainstem, in the midbrain, and the thalamus and enters the uh, neocortex, and then somewhere in some higher level magical spot that we don't really know where it is, understanding takes place. And that's sort of the classic view. That's the bottom-up view of, uh, of how information is processed in the neocortex, and uh, it's, uh, it's very much wrong. <laughs> and, um, and how do we know that it's wrong? Well, we can, um, we can demonstrate that pretty easily using this, uh, this concept of, uh, of musical tension. So what is musical tension? Musical tension is uh, is a, a device <laughs> uh, is a device that um, uh, that is it's used throughout um, uh, music, and it, it basically um, uh, it uh, violates our expectations in ways that uh, that elicit emotions. All right, and so I'm going to play you four sets of harmonic uh, progressions, and the first two um, are uh, I think you'll probably experience as having sort of a, a nice calm ending to them. And the second two have um, what, what would be described as sort of a tense ending to them. 
think I do. There we go. That's one. Okay, so did you get that? So, so the fact that, that um, we are sort of um, surprised or it generates this emotional response, that means that we can't just be passively receiving the sensory information, right? Because we have some expectation about what note, what chord is gonna come next in this chord project, uh, progression. We have an expectation about how it'll be a nice, happy ending to the chord progression. And when that doesn't happen, we're a little bit surprised and it makes us a little bit tense. And even though we know it's coming, it generates the same emotion. Okay, so the brain is making predictions. The fact that the brain is making predictions is not really that surprising, uh, but it's sort of, uh, it's in, in many ways, it's kind of revolutionized our notion of how, um, of how the brain processes information, what it means to be conscious, what it means to be aware of our environment. And the idea is that we move through the world, and at every moment in time, we're making predictions about what's going to happen next. And if those predictions are, uh, are met, if, if they're not violated, then we just go on our merry way. But if they're violated, then it sort of draws our attention and uh, we alter our behavior, all right? And the only time that your brain is passively receiving information is when you're unconscious. So I study the mechanisms of anesthesia, and one of, the, uh, one of the hypotheses that we're testing in the lab is that what happens when you're unconscious under anesthesia is that your brain turns into this passive device that's sort of classically described in the medical textbooks. But when you're conscious, when you're aware, the, act, the, the state of being conscious is the state of making these predictions and then testing them at any, every moment in time. So that's a good question. That's, so, this, so deep sleep, slow away sleep, is thought to be in a state of unconsciousness, but REM sleep, when you're dreaming, is now thought to be a state of consciousness. It's a disconnected consciousness. It's consciousness where you're disconnected from the outside world, but your brain activity for all the world looks like brain activity for when you're awake. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, how do we know that this is true? What, what kind of evidence do we have that this, that this model of expectation is, uh, is really taking place? So this was an experiment in which uh, people were put into a brain scanner that actually can measure the activity of cells in the brain. It's called an fMRI. And uh, the people were stimulated, uh, they were presented uh, sensory stimuli in blocks. That is, for about 50 trials, they were presented with pairs of auditory stimuli. And then the next 50 trials, they're presented with pairs of visual stimuli and then tactile stimuli, then I went back to auditory stimuli. So the people during these blocks of trials had an expectation about what the stimulus was going to be. And what this, what this plot is showing is the brain activity not in response to the stimulation, but the brain activity just prior to the stimulation. And what happens is that in the blocks where the people were expecting an auditory stimulus, the cells in the auditory part of the brain were already active before the stimulus ever happened. They were predicting that an auditory stimulus was going to happen, and that prediction is reflected in their increased level of, of baseline activity before the stimulus. And the same was true with visual stimuli. And again, this is the auditory part of the brain and the visual part of the brain. When they were expecting auditory stimulus, the auditory part of the brain had its activity increase. When they were expecting a visual stimulus, the visual part of the brain had its activity increase. All right, so this expectation um, alters the activity in, in uh, the neocortex, and it's, uh, it's evidence that uh, the brain really is making these predictions as we, um, as we sort of move through the world, or lie in a scanner, as the case may be. Okay, so what does that mean? What does it mean that, uh, that, uh, um, that we're making these predictions? It means that rather than information just coming up from the outside world, information is being internally generated and that information is internally generated based on our knowledge of the, the, the structure of the world, the regular statistical structure of the world, and our, on our experience. And those internally generated representations are sending information back down this, uh, this pathway. And it's being compared with the information that's coming up the pathway. Okay? And this sort of naturally leads to this 
idea of a cortical hierarchy. A cortical hierarchy refers to the fact that certain regions of cortex are sort of closer to the outside world in the sense that the path length, the number of synapses between the cochlea and that structure is shorter. And also the latency, the how long it takes the cells to respond to a sound is shorter in those areas. So the primary auditory cortex is the closest neocortical structure to the cochlea. And then there are there is secondary and tertiary and, and so on, okay? And so this cortical hierarchy sort of plays the role of internally generated representations unfolding down the cortical hierarchy. So you think of a sound and that the details of that sound sort of get unfolded down this hierarchy. And the, um, uh, the cortical hierarchy also allows for information to be coming, to come up from the outside world, to be processed in a variety of ways that we'll talk about. All right, so notice also that I have sort of lots of boxes here for primary cortex and then two boxes for secondary and just one box for, for tertiary. What that means is that there is a convergence. That is that, uh, that cells in, in uh, primary auditory cortex are projecting to the same sets of cells in secondary auditory, cor in auditory cortex, and those cells are then converging into tertiary auditory cortex. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, we know that in, uh, in um, the auditory structures, there's this frequency map. It's called a tonotopic map for tone, tonotopy. There's a frequency map, and in the periphery, and the cochlea, and the brain, and the midbrain, that frequency map is, is almost always there. But as you get into cortex, that frequency map starts to disappear. So it's present in primary auditory cortex. It's, you can sort of see it in secondary auditory cortex, but by the time you get to higher cortical structures, the frequency map is nowhere to be found. Well, the frequency map corresponds to cells in each little tiny section, each little tiny box of primary auditory cortex responding to only one frequency. If those cells are converging on cells in secondary auditory cortex, the cells in secondary auditory cortex are going to have that map smeared. They're going to respond to both of these frequencies, and so on and so forth as you go up the hierarchy. So what, what's happening is that we're going from a type of coding called feature coding, and features of sounds are the frequency, the loudness, the spatial location, okay? We're going from a feature coding to what's called an object coding. What's an object in sound? An object is a symphony or it's a measure, or it's a complex harmonic, okay? So the hierarchy of the neocortex reflects the hierarchy in our physical world. Just like there are buildings, and walls, and rooms, and chairs, there are areas of cortex that are very detail-oriented, respond to very small things, and there are areas of cortex that respond to the big picture, okay? And so as we think of a symphony, there would be a whole region of cortex that would naturally be stimulated by that symphony, and then it, that symphony unfolds down the hierarchy to activate the cells in sequence as they would be as we remember each individual note. Okay, so this area would be active throughout the whole symphony. This is just an example. These cells would be activated in sequence as the individual notes occur in the symphony. All right, so how do we know things like that? So there's a pretty cool experiment that was done in the visual system. So I'll take a detour into the, into the visual system. Comparing the activity in the brain during sensory perception, so when people were shown a picture of a tree, to activity in the brain when people were told to imagine a tree. All right? And what they did is, they again, they put these people into an fMRI scanner so they could look at the um, activity in the brain <coughs> at all the different levels of the, the visual hierarchy, the visual cortical hierarchy. We're very visual creatures, so visual stimuli actually activate a huge amount of, of the brain. And what you can see is that when people saw the tree, the perception, and when they imagined the tree, the patterns of activity are nearly identical. And it's not until you get to the very back of the brain, to primary visual cortex, that the patterns of activity actually start to diverge. And there's a variety of possible reasons for that, Probably the, the, the most likely reason is that people are imagining a tree, but you can only imagine a tree to some level of detail. But when you actually see the tree, you're seeing all the details. That's what you see first, and then you, then you create the tree percept by bringing those details together. All right? Okay, so how might we use this uh, hierarchy to process music? Let's consider 
uh, the example of harmonic complexes, okay? So I'm gonna play you um, some music that was actually composed and recorded by my son. And um, what I want you to pay particular attention to are the uh, guitar notes, okay? Okay, so this is the signal as it appears at the eardrum, okay? And it's a whole gamish, it's a whole mixture of the snare drum and the guitar and the bass guitar all coming together. And this is what, the, what might happen at the cochlea, so this is, this, this is a frequency versus time plot, okay? And then the intensity of the sound is uh, in the colors. So the white parts are the really intense part and the blue is not so intense, all right, or loud part and not so loud. And what I've done is I've just taken a little snippet that has a few of these guitar notes from that solo. And you can see that rather than being a single pure tone, as we saw in the demo, and as we saw in Ruth's demo of the cochlea, each of those guitar notes is actually at a harmonic complex. And that's true of every musical instrument. And what, what we're perceiving, though, when we hear those guitar notes, is we're perceiving one note. We're not perceiving it as a whole set of related sinusoids, related pure tones. We're perceiving one note. So why is that? How is it that, that the cochlea does this beautiful job of breaking this all down into these little fine details? So there's individual cells in the cochlea responding to this, this frequency and this frequency and this frequency, and that is preserved as you go through the brainstem and the midbrain, et cetera. How is it that when we actually perceive this guitar note, it's being perceived as a single object, a single auditory object? So how might that happen? Well, you can imagine that if you have, oops, sorry. You can imagine that if you have cells in auditory cortex, so for example, these might be four cells in primary auditory cortex that are responding to the fundamental of that harmonic complex and then the first, second, and third harmonics. And let's say those cells converge on what's called a pitch cell. And this pitch cell only responds when you get this collection of harmonics occurring at the same time, okay? And so that cell won't respond if... Does this happen? Yeah, there we go. It won't respond if only one or two of the cells is firing, is active, okay? So it won't respond if just the fundamental occurs, or if just the second harmonic, or if the first and third, all right? It'll only respond if, God damn it. Did it? Okay, there we go. Sorry, it, it doesn't show up on the screen. It'll only respond if all of them are activated simultaneously. So the cue, in this case, for figuring out that that harmonic complex is a single auditory object is the fact that there are those um, frequencies that are at integer multiples of each other and they're occurring simultaneously. So we group it by using the timing and also the frequency relationships between the harmonics. And those cues, those timing cues and that frequency convergence occur at the level of auditory cortex uh, to, uh, to activate these, um, these cells in pitch sensitive areas. Okay, so um, finally, am I doing okay on time? Yeah, all right. Uh, so, so I'm showing you how we can be really good at, um, at identifying an auditory object that we can group things and we can, uh, we can take uh, these harmonics and sort of uh, we know intuitively, we've, we, our auditory system, is, it's almost designed to do this, to group them together so we perceive them as a single auditory object. And uh, that's, that's really important in music. It's also really important in, in speech. It's, uh, it's something that we do all the time without even thinking about it. But it's also true that sometimes we're really bad at it. Sometimes we fail miserably to identify uh, the, the, uh, the voices in a musical piece. That is, for example, in a symphony of this size, for example, the symphony of, of a thousand that's playing Mahler's Eighth Symphony, I'm pretty sure 
that nobody in the audience actually was able to identify all thousand voices <laughs> in that symphony. Okay? In fact, we usually can identify only a small number, a half dozen maybe. And if you, you know, if you, if you really listen intensely, you can, you can get more. But in general, we're spectacularly failing to identify the, the musical voices in this, in this piece. And why would that be? Well, if you, if you look at the, the structure of this, of this piece, so this is just a little snippet, the first, uh, the first 20 seconds of it, you can see that, yes, there are these harmonic complexes, but there are so many of them, and the frequencies are spaced so close together that, uh, that we start to get confused about which ones should be grouped together. All right? And so this, this vertical grouping can, uh, can break down the vertical grouping, which sort of requires frequency convergence and onset timing synchrony, that can break down because composers will use these features to actually fool us, to create an auditory illusion, to create a single voice out of many voices. So if you have a choir in which people are singing in harmonically related notes, then when we hear it, we hear it as a harmonic complex and we identify it as a single voice. And the same thing, you can also, there's also grouping that happens over time. So for example, one of the ways that we can sort of follow a melody uh, in, in a melody line during a piece of music is we, um, is, as long as the frequencies don't diverge from each other that much, we can sort of, uh, we can tell that, oh, that's that same frequency that I just heard a second ago. So that must be part of the same voice because it's playing the same note and, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's part of the same melody line. So as long as those, those notes don't change that much, then we can sort of group these things uh, in time as well. And that requires cells to be sort of active for long periods of time, which we have in the brain. And it requires this, you know, this uh, frequency map, which we also have, we know. But the thing is that in music especially, s particular voices, particular instruments, can change frequency wildly from one moment to the next. And so it makes it really difficult for us to do this sort of horizontal or time-based grouping that we typically do for when we're listening to somebody speak. Uh, okay, so, um, so what, um, uh, what's happening is that uh, composers throughout the eons have used these, um, these limitations of our ability to identify voices to create these, these uh, lush sounds. Okay, all right, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, thanks for listening.